This is my friend's 2005 BMW 325Ci with 230,000 miles. The engine was down on power and burning lots of oil, so we decided to replace it. He bought a replacement engine with about half as many miles and we began the swap. However, the replacement engine didn't look so good. We took a look at the original and it was actually in better shape. So now I've wound up doing a full rebuild on the original engine. The engine was already torn down, so in this video I'll start with it fully disassembled. If you do want to see an M54 tear down, I've got one on my channel of the 3 liter in my track car. First off was the parts cleaning process. I add some simple green and hot water to a tub and let the parts soak for a while. For the engine block I use a bigger tub and it came out nice and shiny clean. I made sure to dry everything as best I could to make sure there was no residual water left. This is crucial to prevent corrosion, especially in the threads. The oil squirters looked clean, but I blasted them out just to get any extra oil out. Then I coated all the steel parts with a bit of oil to make sure they don't rust. Some parts, like the crank, weren't too dirty in the first place, and I didn't bother washing them because it'd be difficult to make sure no rust forms. The steel cylinder liners are a good example of how quickly steel parts can flash rust. Besides the rust, the cylinders didn't look too bad, but they'll need some refinishing. I used this, a flex hone, to resurface the cylinders and get rid of the glazing. I simply chuck this in my drill, add some flex hone oil, and make sure to go in and out fast enough to get about a 45 degree crosshatch. The cylinders look much better, but they have to be meticulously cleaned to make sure there's no debris left over. I use a microfiber cloth to wipe them down the best I can, making sure there's no residue. Look at how good these cylinders look. I'm sure the new rings will seal much better than they would with the old cylinders. So I did this before I honed the cylinders, but I'll do it again just to show you. This is a bore gauge. I use this to measure the cylinders to make sure they aren't too out of round or tapered. I measure the top of the cylinder and the bottom of the cylinder, making sure to measure left to right, which is the direction the cylinders usually wear. Despite it having over 200,000 miles, this engine block actually looks perfect. There's less than one thousandth of an inch of out of round and taper on the cylinder walls. Now I can move on to the piston and ring assemblies. Each package of rings has a top ring, which is the first compression ring, a middle ring, which is the second compression ring, and the bottom ring, which is the oil control ring. The top is all marked on these to make sure you don't install them upside down. I need to make sure the ring gaps aren't too small or too big, so I insert them into the cylinders with no pistons so I can measure them. Then I square them up using a piston to make sure they're aligned properly, and then I use a feeler gauge to measure the gap. I go down in size until it fits and there's a little bit of resistance left. Alright, 16. Then I push the ring all the way down to the bottom of the cylinder, but not past where it would normally travel, to check it again. Because the cylinders are worn more at the top, you expect the ring gap to actually decrease as it goes down farther into the cylinder. Just about 14. This is why it's important to check it in both spots. I do this for all three rings for all six cylinders, which takes a little while. Thankfully all the ring gaps looked big enough, but weren't too big, so I didn't have to grind them down at all. I record my measurements and put the rings back in the bag they came from, labeling which cylinder they went to. I do this to make my life easier when I go to assemble the pistons. Next I inspect the crankshaft. All the journals looked good, there was no scoring or scratching or anything like that. So I used my micrometer to measure the journals to make sure they were all the right diameter. Once again, everything looked perfect. The journals were all the right size within a couple ten thousandths of an inch, and there was no tapering evident. So now I can start reassembling everything. The first parts to go back in are the oil squirters. 
These had Loctite when I uninstalled them, so I put some on when I put them back in. These squirt the underside of the piston when the engine is running to make sure everything stays lubricated. Now I unbox my main bearings and insert them into the cylinder block. Once again, everything has to be as clean as possible. I apply some engine assembly lube and then drop the crank in. Then I make sure the main bearing caps are clean and insert the bearings on both sides as well. The next thing I'm going to do is measure the main bearing clearances to make sure there's enough but not too much clearance for the oil. I lay down a strip of green plastic gauge in each one of the crank journals, and then I tighten down my main bearing caps to squish them. When I remove the main bearing caps, the width of the smooshed plastic gauge tells me what my oil clearance is going to be. I check using the chart they give me, and once again, everything looks good. I'm seeing about two to two and a half thousandths of an inch of clearance. The rule of thumb is about a thousandth of an inch for every one inch of journal size. These journals are about two inches, so it's gotta be good, right? Then I clean off all the crusty plastic gauge and apply some more assembly lubricant to the journals. Now the main bearing caps can go on for good. These are labeled for which position they go in, so it's important not to mix them up. I then tighten them down to 15 foot-pounds just for now. Now I can move on to the piston assemblies. First thing I do is take the caps off. These use a rather interesting method of separating the caps. They simply fracture them, which gives you this rough finish on the metal. Some engines use a machined finish where it's nice and flat. The old bearings don't look too bad. There's some regular wear, but nothing concerning. Now I use my ring expanders to remove the old piston rings. This must be why the engine was burning oil. You can see how clogged this oil control ring is. There's supposed to be holes in this ring and you should be able to see through it, but it's completely clogged with carbon. I considered using rings from a different engine that apparently work better for preventing oil consumption but I didn't want to take the chance of them not fitting, and it shouldn't burn any more oil for another 100,000 miles anyways. So now I remove the old rod bearings. Then I break up my micrometers again and check the piston diameter and make sure the walls aren't collapsed. Now comes the painstaking part. For each piston, I sit here with my wooden toothpick and scrape out all the carbon buildup from the ring grooves. I want to get everything out, and I don't want to use anything abrasive, so this is the best way to do it. Then, I make sure everything's spotless, and I can insert my new rod bearings. I didn't bother disassembling the piston wrist pin or retaining clips. I couldn't feel any play in these, and it's kind of a pain to take them apart and put them back together again, so I didn't bother. Now I insert all my new rings, making sure they're not put them in upside down. This is what the oil control ring is supposed to look like, not clogged with carbon. You're supposed to install these so that the ring gaps are all opposing each other. This is to make sure any compression that does leak by one ring has to go all the way to the other side of the piston to leak past the next ring.
Then I get my ring compressor and compressor ring so I can slide the pistons in the cylinders. I apply a little bit of oil to help them go in, slide the piston in, give it a few taps to seat it down to the cylinder. I then repeat the whole plastic gauge procedure for the rod bearings as well to make sure those clearances are good too. I'm using my old rod bolts here, which I don't really care about. If they stretch too much, that's fine, I've got new ones anyways. I'm seeing about two thousandths of an inch of clearance here. That's quite good considering these rod journals are about 1.7 inches. Now I insert my new rod bolts and tighten up the 15 foot pounds just for now. I coat all the fasteners with plenty of oil to make sure they don't bind. I give the crank a quick spin just to make sure nothing's binding. I rinse and repeat the whole process for all six cylinders. The whole engine spins over just fine with no binding. You shouldn't turn it too much without your bolts torqued down all the way because it could be possible to spin a bearing. There's still some carbon buildup on the pistons, but it's not really worth cleaning off. Now I use my angle gauge to turn the bolts and make sure they're actually turned the right amount. It's quite simple. You use the clip to make sure the base doesn't turn, you set it to zero degrees, and then you can see exactly how much you're turning the bolts. I believe all these bolts get turned to 70 degrees for the rods and main bolts. Just to make sure you don't over or under tighten any of these bolts because I do have a spec. So I would be done with the bottom end, but now I've got to do the oil pump. This thing is pretty nasty, so I pulled it apart to make sure it was still okay. It does have some amount of scoring, which isn't terribly abnormal. What is abnormal is that there's a chip where the shaft goes in. It's also got some weird discoloration on the bottom as well. I decided I probably shouldn't use this oil pump. I pulled the oil pump off the lower miles replacement engine and see how it looked. It had similar levels of scoring, maybe a little less, but more importantly, there wasn't any chip. So I oiled it up and reassembled it. There's also a plunger in this side that I believe acts as a regulator, but this is very difficult to replace, and I did it on my M54B30, and it's not really worth it.
I decided not to hot tank the oil pump because of all the parts that are inside, so I just wiped it up on the outside a little bit. Then it gets bolted onto the cylinder block. I reinstall both the sprockets and then the nut as well. This is a reverse threaded nut, so to be sure to turn it to the left to tighten it. The spec for this is about 18 foot-pounds if I recall, but my torque wrench doesn't work in reverse. The rolling torque of my engine was about 15 foot-pounds, and the sprocket on the oil pump is a little bit bigger, so I figure if I turn it in reverse, it'll be about 18 to 20 foot-pounds of torque in that nut. There's a drilled nut that you can install safety wire on for the oil pump, but this is really only necessary for track cars. The baffle, timing cover, and oil pickup were still really filthy, so, so I repeated my whole cleaning process for these. I switched to my camera that actually has autofocus, and then I reinstall the baffle. The old oil ring on this oil pick was brittle, and it's very important to replace this and make sure you don't get oil starvation. Next, I slide in the pickup, tighten it down, and the bottom end rebuild is almost done. Now I have to reinstall the galley plugs. Gallery plugs. I actually don't know which one it is. These are left over from the machining process for the main oil passages in the cylinder block. I removed this when I cleaned out the cylinder block to make sure everything was clean, but now I have to reinstall them. Unfortunately, these don't bottom out, and they're not a tapered thread, so you have to apply Loctite to make sure they seal properly. There's one on the front of the engine that you see here, and one more in the back. Now I install my timing chain and timing chain guides. I'm using new timing chain guides, but not a new timing chain because they really aren't a problem for these engines. Next, I punch in my front main seal, which isn't too difficult with this handy hammer I made. Now I install a timing cover, not forgetting the gaskets. It's important to do this before you install the cylinder head to make sure your engine won't leak. It's because the head gasket extends and overhangs to the timing cover. If you try doing this after, your engine will leak, just like my 3 liter M54, which is still leaking to this day. And with that, the bottom end rebuild is done. I'm cleaning up the oil pan for now to reinstall it, but I'm not going to reinstall it until I do the rear main seal. I can't do the rear main seal until the engine is off the stand because the stand is blocking it. So I'm going to call it here for the bottom end. As always, thanks for watching, feel free to like and subscribe, and stay tuned for the next part where I move on to the cylinder head.